A state of emergency to help Grady Hospital get back up and running again after major flood damage. Tonight, the state and federal help on the way. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Well, we are, thank you for joining us. We are here uh, for 11 Alive News in primetime. We are taking a much improved forecast that is coming your way for the weekend. But first, we have to get through Friday night. Our chief meteorologist, Chris Holcomb, is joining us now with a look at what's happening outside. Yeah, we have that rain that's over us right now. This is another batch that's moving in. You know, it was very soggy, very chilly today. We had areas of rain, and then when it wasn't actively raining, it was still some mist and drizzle around. Here's the next wave that's moving through our area right now. This is coming in from the south and west. We have some good showers right over us here in Atlanta. Light rain mixing in with a little bit of moderate rain, too. And then over on the west side, you can see some of those showers that are in parts of uh, Paulding County down into Carroll County. And then if we move down a little bit more here on the south side, you see a better coverage of rain from South Fulton, Coweta County, Heard County, Troop County, over near LaGrange, Merriweather County, down toward Thomaston and Upson County, Pike and Lamar County, also into Henry County, Fayette County, Clayton. So a lot of, of rain, <coughs> excuse me, in our area. And that kind of stops just as it's moving north of I-20. But it will continue feeding into this direction here. You see it moving up out of the south and west moving toward the north and there's even more still in the Gulf of Mexico that keeps moving our way as well. Now I know you see all of these storms here down in South Alabama moving into Southeast Georgia. It looks like the hardest rain and those storms are going to stay down to the south. In fact, let me show you what we're watching out there as we go through the rest of the evening hours tonight and overnight hours. Here's a look in Coweta County. The roads are wet and you can see we still have some rain coming down and the flags blowing just a little bit with some of the breezes there. If you can see those puddles there on the street, still some raindrops falling down into those puddles and more rain coming in. The severe weather threat is going to stay down in parts of South and East Georgia and into Northern Florida. No concerns about severe weather here, just additional rain that'll be moving in during the nighttime hours. Here's that batch that moves in mainly light, but some moderate showers through the rest of the evening hours. And then overnight, things start to get a little bit better. We'll see these rain showers tapering off as the entire system moves off to the east. Early in the morning, it is still possible you may be experiencing some mist and drizzle to start the day with a good coverage of clouds, but then those clouds will eventually break up and some drier air will move in. I'll let you know what that means for your Sunday coming up in just a few minutes. Chris, thank you. A sad update now to a story that so many of you have been following on our 11 Alive social media pages. South Fulton police have just confirmed that an attorney who disappeared a week ago has died. Officials say 30-year-old Demetrius Allen was involved in a traffic accident in Clayton County just before his family reported him missing. He died a short time later at the hospital. The 30-year-old was in town from Orlando and was last seen a week ago at the 10 ATL lounge on Flat Shoals Road in southeast Atlanta. His family says he was in town for a job interview with Delta Airlines. Tonight, a family in mourning after a man was gunned down on the job by a fellow employee. The county is requesting that we assist and reference our active shooter. Confirm shell cases in front of the break room area. Confirm shell cases. It's a male that's been shot in the abdomen. The shots were fired just before shift change this morning. An employee shared this cell phone video with us showing the emergency response at the Dark Container Corporation in Rockdale County. Uh, the big question that remains is why. Why did the 18-year-old suspect walk into the plant and kill Taurus Andrews? That's a question his family also wants to know tonight as well. 11 Live's Elwin Lopez has more from Conyers where she's learning about the victim. His sister Sharika says Taurus Andrews was her little brother, one of four siblings, a loving person and so full of life. I want to read some of her statement to you. She said, quote, he had no kids of his own, but loved his nieces and nephews, adding that he was the type of person that you would want to be your friend. Taurus Andrews was 42 years old. His sister tells us he had only worked at the plant for a little over a year, and this morning, authorities say he was shot and killed by a temporary employee. The victim's sisters say they worked in the same building, but she wasn't sure 
whether the suspect and the victim knew each other. Now, I want to take you back to earlier today when authorities got a call right before 7 a.m. about an active shooter situation at the Dart Container Corporation in Conyers. Units arrived within about just three minutes and went in to look for the suspect, now identified as 18-year-old Cameron Golden. A truck driver told them, the authorities, that he had seen a man fleeing the scene. Now, authorities found a man, now identified as the victim, Taurus Andrews, who had been shot. Police evacuated more than 30 employees via school buses to a nearby Baptist church. At this time, police aren't sure how the suspect was able to flee the scene. We don't know at this time if he's uh, fired shots at any other individuals. Uh, we're trying to find those answers out from some of the witnesses who were in that building. Now, they were able to track down Golden at a Greyhound bus station in Birmingham, Alabama, but still, there are a lot of questions here. We don't know what exactly led up to that shooting, and we're still trying to learn that information. As soon as we get it, we'll bring it to you in the upcoming hours and on 11 Alive app. Governor Brian Kemp has ordered flags to be flown at half-staff Monday in honor of the Georgia airmen who died during last week's shootings at the Pensacola Naval Air Station. Cameron Walters was killed during the shooting last Friday. Investigators say three people were killed when a member of the Saudi Air Force opened fire. The victims and the alleged shooter who was also killed were all studying at the Naval Aviation School Command. The FBI is investigating as an act of terror. Walters will be returned to his home in Effingham County tomorrow. A resident of a Buckhead party mansion who was busted for noise violation has been sentenced to 30 days in jail. Tosin Aduaye was also fined $7,000. He had been living in the mansion, which he says is owned by family members, when he got in trouble with the law. People had been renting it on Airbnb and hosting loud parties there. He's also facing watershed violations. The judge has yet to rule on that. Police have arrested Jose Riviera for allegedly killing a man at a home in Swanee earlier this week. They say Christopher Morand was shot at a house party and witnesses there say that Morand was killed after he got into a fight with some other people at that party. There's no word yet on a motive. Help is now on the way for Grady Memorial Hospital. Governor Brian Kemp has declared a state of emergency, clearing the way now for state and federal dollars. Last weekend, a pipe burst causing major flooding. The hospital has just started accepting new trauma, stroke, and burn patients today. As 11 Alive's Latasha Givens reports, the money and resources are very much needed. Grady is incredibly grateful to the governor for declaring an emergency. Doing so unlocks important state and federal resources that will help us move quickly to repair the damage and fully restore the medical care that Atlanta has come to expect from Grady Health System. Grady officials say last week a 24-inch pipe that provides clean water to the air conditioning system burst, flooding the sixth floor and damaging over 200 beds. The hospital was forced to divert incoming patients to other area hospitals, placing an unexpected burden on those facilities. This declaration is absolutely critical to the thousands of patients we treat each day and to the hospitals that voluntarily stretched their own capacity limits this past week in order to care for patients who were temporarily displaced. Officials say repairs could take up to three months, but with the declaration of the state of emergency, Grady will soon receive a 30-bed mobile hospital from North Carolina. The mobile hospital is designed to augment or temporary, temporarily replace a medical facility that's been affected by an emergency event. The mobile hospital requested will expand Grady's current capacity. Grady officials say they are bringing in a forensic engineer so they understand exactly what happened to help them figure out how to keep it from happening again. Well, the cold weather and rain did not stop lines from forming at the new 76 gas station in Swanee this morning. That's because customers were able to take advantage of 76 cent gas. Hundreds of people lined up on Peachtree Industrial Boulevard in hopes of getting some of that cheap gas. It was all part of the station's grand opening. Deal seekers told 11 Alive that despite waiting in the, the line for even hours, it was well worth it. Awesome, awesome. It makes me feel awesome. You know, to save that amount of money, it's awesome. I'm number 63. Um, I'm here because I'm on a budget right now, and when gas is less than half the cost of it is everywhere else, it's worth it to come. Amazing. That's definitely a huge blessing to have to just pump for 76 cents versus the 2 and $3 that's been going around now. 
Well, everything was not lost for people who weren't able to get that gas for the cheap price. The station also gave away prizes to customers who missed out on the deal. For more on this story, visit mylawrencevillenews.com. A UGA grad student murdered just weeks before his graduation. Next, how another Metro Atlanta University is honoring him tonight. And don't forget, we are streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe and join in on the conversation in the community section. There's more 11 Live news in prime time coming up. Benjamin Lloyd Clower's name was not announced at the Georgia Tech PhD graduation today, but his presence was felt at the ceremony. Ben will never walk across the stage or receive the diploma he'd worked so hard towards because he was murdered last month. Caitlin Ross reports his dad still attended that service today. Very bittersweet. Steve Clower leaned forward in his chair as the graduates crossed the stage. That should have been him someday waiting for a moment that should have been so different. It should have been Ben's moment. At least a little piece of him got to do it. Dr. Dr. Christine Young never met Ben, but she brought him with her as she crossed the stage. And they wanted to bring part of Ben here, so they brought a locket with some of his hair in it. I won't ever be able to see Ben walk across that stage but at least I know a little part of them got to. Dr. Young knew this is what Ben wanted most in his life. Their families are friends, and when she heard he was murdered, she wanted to do something, anything to help. Ben was weeks away from graduating from UGA with his master's degree in artificial intelligence. Georgia Tech was his next stop. I feel kind of cheated that this was my son's passion to be here. Ben was quietly brilliant, tutoring kids in his spare time, creating a course at Georgia Tech for high school students interested in robotics. But the way he was killed, it was loud. My son was just at home eating dinner, innocent, unarmed, and somebody walked in and murdered him. In the wrenching 911 calls from moments after the shooting, off-duty Madison County Deputy Trey Adams tells police he thought his wife was having an affair with Ben. She was not. Ben's father says she was scared of her husband and came to Ben for help. He wanted to help people. And uh, actually, when this happened to him, he was trying to help a friend. He hopes time will ease his pain, but it may never answer the question, why? He's my best friend, but he respected me as his father. This will be with me the rest of my life. It will never make sense to me. Ben's friends have created an endowment at the University of Georgia to help other students study AI. 
They've already raised $220,000 in his honor so far. The suspect in Ben's murder, Trey Adams, will be back in court on January 16th. He is charged with murder. Well, we're tracking this band of rain that's moving through our area right now. A little more organized area of rain, more than just mist and drizzle. This is more light rain and even a couple of pockets of moderate rain, too. It's pushing in from the south and west, and it's moving toward the north and east. So let's start off here in Atlanta, and you can see some of the showers that have moved in through the city. Now they're pushing in on the north side into parts of North Fulton County, also into Gwinnett County, even into the southern parts of Forsyth County and the south end of Lake Lanier. This is about to move into your area. Much of Gwinnett County is covered with this rain into Cab County back into Rockdale County over into Walton and Newton County as well again with those pockets of moderate rain and then there's even more uh, down to the south and west and even heavier stuff back into Alabama near Auburn that's about to move into LaGrange we have some moderate rain in Coweta County also in parts of Pike Lamar County Spalding County and Henry County and when we put this into motion you can see that that flow is still coming in from the south and west still feeding in that moisture that's coming in from the Gulf of Mexico and that flow will continue tonight, spreading that moisture our way. Now, I want you to notice that the individual showers are moving up toward the north and east, but the entire system is slowly moving over to the east. And once that pushes out of here, we will see the rain chances going down as we head into your Saturday. But the storm threat is mainly down into parts of uh, southwest, southeast Alabama and southwest Georgia. That's where you see all of this lightning here. That is going to stay down to the south. I'm not worried about that lightning moving up into to our area. There could be a couple rumbles of thunder and flashes of lightning on the south side, maybe in parts of Meriwether County down toward Upson County. You might be hearing some of that thunder down there in a bit with some of these showers, but I don't expect any here in the metro Atlanta area. Let's take a look at the bigger picture right now and you can see what we're watching. This is a live look. This is our camera down in Noonan. I actually zoomed in a little bit more there to the street so that you can see these puddles that are on the road there as the cars are moving through. This is live from our tower cam there right there around the courthouse square. And that just kind of goes to show you the type of rain, kind of the uh, the pace of the rain that's coming down, the rate of the rain that's coming down with those uh, raindrops going into the puddles there. And it is a soggy night and it's still very chilly out there as well. Now take a look at these temperatures today. We really didn't have a, a wide range of temperatures. We held at 38 degrees from two o'clock in the morning until about nine in the morning. Then we went up to 39 and then our high this afternoon was 43 degrees. So you can see only a range of temperatures from 38 to 43 this afternoon. Very uh, chilly for this time of year, colder than what we should be for this time of year. And then I know you're looking at those temperatures and we're pretty much going to be holding there for the rest of the evening hours and overnight. We might actually move up a degree or two during the overnight hours. You see the temperatures pretty uniform all around, generally lower to mid 40s. We've got a couple upper 40s. Look at Blairsville. You're at 48 degrees, actually a little bit warmer uh, up in the mountains right now. So here you see those temperatures for the overnight maybe moving up just a degree or two, 44 between 10 and 2, 45 at 4, and then at 6 and 8 in the morning, right around 46 degrees. We have the showers that'll be with us overnight, but you see the percentages going down is the rain chance goes down a little bit as that last batch moves on over to the east. Just a chance for a lingering shower or a little bit of mist and drizzle really early in the morning. Then rain chances go down. The clouds clear out and we'll see some sunshine finally once we get into the afternoon hours and temperatures rebound. We'll get up to about 55 degrees in the afternoon. So on our scale, <coughs> excuse me, from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day, we're going to go with an 8 on the wisometer. Here you can see that uh, last batch that's moving through tonight. It gets out of here in the morning, overcast skies, maybe some mist and drizzle, but then those clouds start to break up as we head into the afternoon hours. And we'll see a little bit of sunshine coming through and then even a better day on Sunday with a 10 on the wisometer, partly cloudy skies warming up to 61 and then the clouds increase again Monday watching a system coming in from Mississippi and Alabama that will give them a chance for severe weather. We think it's going to be weaker when it gets in here, but we'll have showers Monday into Tuesday, maybe some thunder and lightning and then dry colder though Wednesday and Thursday. We're down to 28 Thursday morning and then by Friday up to 54 with the rain chance comes back in later in the day. All right, Chris, thank you. Last night, former Falcon Mike Vick had one of his biggest rushing records broken. It was done by Lamar Jackson, the Baltimore Ravens QB, who has taken the league by storm with his arm and his legs. Jackson is the latest quarterback to grow up watching number seven in the Georgia Dome and be inspired to change the game just like Vick did. Here's our Jeff Hollander. Lamar keeps. He's got the record. The all-time single season 
Rushing record for a quarterback belongs to number eight. NFL executives once thought he should be a wide receiver. Now, Lamar Jackson is on top of the MVP race as a quarterback. I couldn't wish to be any place else. The Baltimore Ravens quarterback broke Michael Vick's single-season rushing record with a quick five-yard dash during the team's win over the New York Jets. Tame compared to how he's been doing it all season long. Oh, he it himself. Look at him turn back and forth. Oh! He broke his ankles! Now he's got an entourage! And he's got a touchdown! Jackson has said many times he mirrors the style of Michael Vick, the former number one pick who changed the game with his feet here in Atlanta. Off the plate, Vick has some running room. Inside the 30, inside the 20. Vick into the end zone. Falcons win. More quarterbacks in the league today grew up watching Vick and were inspired to play like him. My, my favorite player growing up, um, it's amazing. And I'm going to cherish that forever. And you just got to keep it going. Right? You know, records meant to be broken, like he said. There was a time Vic never thought his record of 1,039 yards would ever be broken. Jackson did it with two games left in the regular season. We knew it was coming, man. Like I said, he was the guy for the job. In fact, many of Vic's records have been broken, and with more mobile quarterbacks on the way in the NFL, this could just be the beginning. But no one will ever forget he started it all. Lamar's well, stardom has grown within the league as well. After last night's game, he signed autographs for players on the opposing team. The Ravens are now officially AFC North champs, so the Lamar show will continue into the postseason. Still ahead, new details about a notorious serial killer's rampage across the country, one that includes the murder of a father and daughter from right here in Georgia. Coming up this weekend on The Reveal. I felt like this was a nightmare, like this was a never-ending nightmare. America's vaping crisis. I never knew. I never knew my son was doing it. I'm a mom and a nurse. They didn't even ask. It seemed very nonchalant. He just took my money. Our reveal cameras go undercover to see if enough is being done to keep vaping products out of the hands of children. <laughs> These products are not nearly as safe as advertised. And we see for ourselves exactly what's inside a vaping pod. Join us Sunday at 6 for the reveal.
It has been 45 years since serial killer Paul John Knowles, or PJK, went on a cross-country murder spree, killing at least 18 people in the span of five months. Now, newly uncovered tape recordings indicate that the infamous Dozier School may have played a role in his unraveling. If I had to live over again, I wouldn't. He wouldn't do it. I wouldn't live again. Paul John Knowles made kill tapes. He recorded the details of his murders. The tapes were handed over to the court and locked away in Macon. According to investigators, both fire and a flood damaged countless court records. PJK's kill tapes are presumed to be lost forever. But there's a second set of tapes, and for the first time ever, they provided a telling look into the mind of a serial killer in his own words. Paul John Knowles was sent away to the infamous Dozier School for Boys. A 2013 investigation revealed that at least 50 bodies were buried on the grounds of the school. To date, more than 500 former students have alleged brutal beatings and a culture of abuse. It institutionalized him instead of reforming him. He didn't go in a killer. He was just a way we're sold. They got tired of the beatings when he was a young and got away from it the best way he knew how at the time. And one thing led to another, one thing led to another. The state of Florida has a hand in this too. How do you mean that? Before you intended to be shot before. They took him out and killed him. They took him out and killed him. Do you think they planned to do that? We'll let God be the judge of that. We'll let God be the judge of that. From abuse at home to being in and out of reform schools, our 11 Alive team Atticus found even more insight on those tapes. To hear more about what Paul John Knowles had to say and his brother's take on what went wrong, you can head over to the 11 Alive YouTube page to watch the full documentary, The Casanova Killer. The new Richard Jewell movie, centered around the Centennial Olympic Park bombing, comes out today, but now a key part of the case says some of the details in the film are far from the truth. We will tell you how next.
We're tracking that rain that continues to move through the area. It's pushing in from the southwest, moving toward the northeast. And as you can see, there's more of it to come back in Alabama that's crossing over the state line into West Georgia. Around Metro Atlanta, the rain shower activity is expanding. We already had a good coverage of mist and drizzle that was so light it wasn't really showing up on radar but now you can see the better coverage of rain is over us here pushing up 85 there at the 985 split in Gwinnett County we have some moderate rain that's coming down a couple pockets of heavy rain too we don't have any thunder and lightning with this on the north side there is a little bit of lightning well down to the south this is all moving up toward the north and the east I'll take you over here to the west side you can see some of these showers through Cobb County West Cobb also into parts of Bartow County and Cherokee County right there on the Paulding County line down into Douglas County, South Fulton County, Heard County, where we see some of those showers there, Coweta County. The better coverage of rain is down here around uh, Troop County near LaGrange and moving up into Meriwether County. Just everybody getting in on some of these good showers that are moving in. And more of that is going to be pushing our way. I want to take you down here to the south, though, and you can see some of the lightning. This is mainly around Columbus and southward. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe some folks around LaGrange, maybe into Meriwether County or Upson County, might get a little bit of lightning with this or hear some rumbles of thunder, but for the most part, the system is going to be keeping the lightning well down to the south. Take a look out there right now live and you can see what we're watching. This is our tower cam in Athens. The roads are wet from that mist and drizzle, even though we don't have anything, any active torrential downpours or anything right now in the Athens area. It is very soggy there and also still very chilly. So here's that area of rain that's going to keep moving our way during the evening hours. We'll see that good coverage of showers around light to at times moderate and maybe even a couple of pockets of some of that heavier rain. But this is the main part of the rain and the last bit of it that's going to move off to the east by early tomorrow morning. We're still going to have some clouds, maybe some mist and drizzle, but then uh, things are going to start drying out as we go through the daytime hours. Stay with us. We're going to let you know what that means for the rest of your weekend. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Chris, thank you. A vigil will be held tomorrow evening for the brother and sister killed earlier this month in Rockdale County. The mother of Jada Curry and Josh Baker says they were killed in a Conyers home by Jada's husband. That husband, Michael Curry, was also found dead inside that same home. Police won't confirm any details about the deaths, but they do say they found the bodies after being asked to do a welfare check on the home. The vigil will be held at the Kip Academy in South Fulton. It is scheduled for 7 p.m. Crews have finished draining fuel tanks on an overturned cargo ship three months after it capsized off the coast of Georgia. Salvage workers removed more than 320,000 gallons of oil from the St. Simon Sound. At least 500 workers helped remove the 26 fuel tanks inside the capsized MV Golden Ray cargo ship. The next step is to safely remove the cargo ship from the water. Clayton County School says it has put in new policies to make sure that school buses are running on time and kids are getting to class when they should. At the beginning of the year, there were 40 open bus driver positions. That coupled with sick calls or absences from drivers led to late pickups and late drop-offs for students. Clayton County officials say they have instituted new bonus programs and increased driver pay to make sure buses run on time. Right now, there are 22 unfilled driver positions. The use of cancer-causing ethylene oxide is likely to get a hard look from Georgia lawmakers next year, and much of the information may come from another state. It's been an issue in Illinois now for a couple of years where Stargenics also has a plant located. 11 Alive's Doug Richards takes a look at how it's being handled there. It had been business as usual for much of this year for the Stargenics plant in Cobb County. But as this plant continued using ethylene oxide to sterilize medical equipment, another sterogenics plant in suburban Chicago was getting shut down by the state of Illinois for leaking the same chemical compound. We would like to see ethylene oxide emissions banned in the state of Illinois uh, so that no community is affected in the way ours has been. Illinois' state environmental protection agency lists three ethylene oxide using plants, all in suburban Chicago. The sterogenics plant there is shut down, but two other plants north of Chicago are still in operation. Recently, scientists tested blood samples of residents nearby for ethylene oxide. It was statistically significant. Dr. Susan Buchanan says folks living near the Illinois plants tested for higher levels of ethylene oxide. It is concerning that 
our statistics show that the people group of people living closest to the plant had a higher average level than people living farther away. While Illinois has shut down one plant and tested residents near two others, Georgia is a contrast. The state has five plants that use ethylene oxide. The Cobb County plant is temporarily closed, and no testing of residents near any of the Georgia plants has been reported. While Georgia's environmental regulators have monitored air quality and sanctioned companies like BD and Covington for leaks, the state is led by a governor who campaigned against government regulations. My chainsaw's ready to rip up some regulations. Which Brian Kemp considers to be anti-business. Dr. Buchanan in Illinois says regulators could save lives. This is a known carcinogen. The public should not be exposed to it, period. Dr. Buchanan says there is no proof that the higher ethylene oxide levels found in people near the Illinois plants are caused by emissions from the Illinois plant. She says there needs to be more testing, and she thinks Georgia might want to look at that, too. If you are seeking more information on ethylene oxide and how Georgia fits into this national conversation, just take a look on the 11 Alive app. Robert said, don't believe everything you hear. The award-winning docu-series that shed light on sexual misconduct allegations against singer R. Kelly is getting a sequel. Lifetime announced Surviving R. Kelly Part 2, The Reckoning, will air next month. It is expected to feature interviews with new alleged survivors and supporters. Kelly, for his part, has denied any wrongdoing as he faces state and federal charges. The network says more than 26.8 million people watched the original documentary earlier this year. The latest installment is set to unfold over three nights, starting January 2nd. Clint Eastwood's new movie, Richard Jewell, is out in theaters today, but it's also at the center of a media firestorm. The movie is based on the 1996 Atlanta Olympic Park bombing, and tonight, the reporter portrayed in the film is being defended by her roommate from that time. Some say the film portrays Kathy Shrugs as a reporter who traded sex for stories, but her longtime friend tells Natisha Lance that nothing could be further from the truth. Kathy was not the type of person who would ever have violated rules or ethics or anything like that. She would never do sex to get a story or get a source. Penny Furr met Kathy Scruggs 25 years ago. At the time, Furr was a defense attorney in a gang-related murder trial. Scruggs was covering the case as a reporter for the AJC. After the trial, the two became fast friends and eventually roommates. Penny says the Centennial Olympic Park bombing happened about a year after the pair moved in together. She learned Richard Jewell was a suspect long before it splashed across headlines. She said she had sources inside the police department. Kathy was very colorful, very smart, extremely smart, extremely driven and just a very hard worker. Penny wants Warner Brothers to warn viewers that the movie is based on a true story. However, all of the events are not completely factual. I think that's the least they can do. I think they should have come to talk to people that knew Kathy before, especially if they were putting something inflammatory like that in the movie. She believes the Jewel movie sacrificed accuracy for drama. Kathy did not deserve this. She did not deserve this. Well, Penny has not yet decided if she will see the movie, but she highly doubts it. More than anything, she wants people to know that Kathy did not deserve this kind of treatment. Still ahead, the bodies of six people have been recovered days after a deadly volcanic eruption on a small island in New Zealand. <laughs>
bodies of six people have been recovered days after a deadly volcanic eruption on a small island in New Zealand. Police and military specialists launched a risky operation to recover the remains this morning. NBC's Janice Macufreya reports from New Zealand. This morning, a high-stakes mission to recover bodies from the island. Military teams wearing protective suits recovered six bodies about 1,000 feet from the crater. A ground search failed to find two others, now believed to be in the water. The conditions and terrain on the island were difficult. Yet it also revealed the first look at White Island since the volcano erupted, now a moonscape of thick ash. The island is highly volatile. Even today, there was the chance it would erupt. But authorities here are feeling pressure to give families closure. Relatives of the missing boarded boats before dawn, holding a prayer service at sea. The tragedy has taken an emotional toll here, a town that thrives on tourism, and White Island has long been its main draw. Nearly all of the 47 people on the island were tourists who had come to New Zealand from other countries for vacation. Can you speak to plans that are in the works now to try to get the wounded home? I do not believe there are other plans in place yet, but till that time, they will be in the very best of care here. Recovery teams will be back out there tomorrow. Divers will search the water around the island for the two bodies they believe are still missing. Janice Mackey Freyer, NBC News, Fakatani, New Zealand. Well, here in Atlanta and at 11 Alive, we're hearing the rain on the roof of our building. I know many of you might be hearing the rain on the roof of your home where we have these showers that are moving through light to moderate rain. There have been a couple pockets of heavy rain with this, too. This is that batch that we've been tracking here coming from the south and west, moving up toward the north and east. It has moved in over us here in Atlanta. It has crossed over I-20. Now much of the north side getting in on some of these showers, even through parts of Gwinnett County, Southern Hall County around Lake Lanier. It's getting wet. Also more showers into a Cherokee County and Bartow County. Floyd County seeing some of this rain too. Most of the action is right here over the city of Atlanta. This is where we have that more moderate rain that's coming in. And then on the south side as well, we have some pockets of heavy rain mixed in with moderate rain and some light rain showers too. And then this next rain wave that's coming in here from Alabama toward Auburn, moving right up 85 into Troop County around LaGrange, that keeps pushing our way too. So we're gonna be stuck in this pattern here for a while. So the individual cells with this and the individual rain showers, as you can tell when we put this into motion, that's moving up toward the north and east, but then the entire shield of rain is going to gradually during the overnight hours shift on over to the east and then that's going to be the last bit of rain that we'll be dealing with for a while overnight tonight and even a few of those showers lingering into tomorrow morning. Now as you go down more to the south, I want you to see this. We have some thunder and lightning with these storms from the Florida Panhandle into southeast Alabama, southwest Georgia. Closest thunder and lightning to us is right here just near the Columbus area. I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of you folks in parts of uh, Heard County or Troop County, Meriwether County, Upson County, Pike and Lamar counties, it wouldn't be out of the question that y'all might have a little bit of lightning, but I don't think it'll extend even any more up toward the north. Uh, here's a live look at what we're watching out there. We've been kind of keeping an eye on some of our tower cams. This is a close up view of the Christmas tree there uh, under the Atlanta Braves sign at SunTrust Park. And you can see that the sidewalks and everything are very soggy and we have a little bit of light rain that's coming down right there and even more uh, that's going to be pushing in as well. Now take a look at the Almanac today. We started off at 37 this morning, only got up to 43 degrees today. So that's only about a six degree range in temperatures from morning into the afternoon. We should be around 54 for a high temperature this time of year. This rain is helping us with our deficit a little bit. It's not knocking it out, but at least it's helping it come down. Remember this time last night, we were talking about our rain deficit about eight and a half inches below where we should be in rainfall. Well, we picked up 1.24 inches of rain and our deficit now is at uh, a little more than seven and a third, right at a seven and a third inches below where we should be in rainfall. We still have a long way to go. We're not going to catch up on that by the end of the year, so we will end the year uh, with a deficit. Right now, look at that. Our temperature did move up one degree. We were at 43 earlier last hour, and we mentioned that through the evening hours and overnight, we might see those temperatures actually going up a degree or two. So we went up to 44. We may be around 45 during the overnight hours, and we see those temperatures pretty uniform all around North Georgia. So the good news is, as we're finishing up the day and finishing up the week with this soggy and cold weather, the rain is going to be moving out 
out. We might see a couple of lingering showers or a little bit of light rain in the morning or mist and drizzle. Then everything moves over to the east and we'll see the clouds gradually breaking up during the day. And then as the sunshine breaks through and we're going to see that northeast wind kind of get scoured out, we'll see the temperatures able to move up a little bit. We'll be in the 50s tomorrow, whereas today we are in the 40s, 50s tomorrow and then 60s as we get into Sunday. But then the rain comes back early next week and we'll be watching uh, some storms with that possible over to our west in uh, Mississippi and Alabama. But we think by the time it gets to us, it's going to be a little bit weaker and eight on the wasometer tomorrow. This is our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. 55 for a high decreasing clouds. Here's that batch of rain that's moving through now. It's going to be with us this evening as that just drifts on over to the east. We're still going to have overcast skies in the morning, some pockets of mist and drizzle, and then by afternoon these clouds break up. We'll see a little bit of sunshine breaking through, and then Sunday is going to be even better. Partly cloudy skies, a little warmer up to 61 degrees, and that's going to be a 10 on the wasometer. A 7 on Monday as clouds increase. Showers move in late, maybe some rumbles of thunder. That'll extend into early Tuesday before it clears out again and starts cooling off again. 59 for a high on Tuesday and then really cold Wednesday and Thursday morning at or below freezing 28 Thursday, but then back to 54 on Friday with a few showers coming back in later in the day. Chris, thank you. Most servers dread having a large party walk into the restaurant, but one Georgia waitress received the surprise of a lifetime and tonight we're hearing from her for the first time. And if you missed the story earlier this week on primetime, here it is. Janet Ballard is a server at the Cracker Barrel in Dublin, Georgia. And according to the general manager, a party of 11 asked for their best server. And they got Janet. And Ballard has been with that restaurant now for 12 years. So you can imagine she is good at her job. Out of appreciation for her service, everyone at that table decided to chip in $100 for the tip, making an $1,100 total. She says all she could do was praise God. I was so numb. It's never happened to me because usually the biggest giver to get the least. So I was so numb. And it was like, uh, Miss Janet, I know you start praising God and speaking in tongues. I said, really? I was so overwhelmed. I just, I didn't know whether I was just being uh, punked or not. Well, she says it was the biggest tip that she has ever received. So certainly a great way to spread some Christmas cheer this holiday season. So to come, a Texas woman with a special connection to Atlanta. Next, her plea to find the person who was gifted with her baby's heart nearly two decades ago.
19 years ago, a little boy here in Atlanta received the gift of life from a newborn baby in Texas. Now, nearly two decades later, the mother of that baby wants to reconnect with the little boy who's now a man and has a piece of her daughter's heart. Tiffany Liu from our sister station in Dallas has that mother's story. That was the day after she was born when we were leaving the hospital. Most people never met Crystal Hogan's daughter. This is um, her memory book that the funeral home gave to me. Emma was a day away from being three months old. I just remember them telling me as I watched from behind the glass that her heartbeat just was not strong. It was SIDS. And she wasn't going to make it. They asked me if I wanted to hold her. Sudden infant death syndrome. Um, while she passed away, and I did. Almost two decades passed, but Crystal doesn't have closure knowing a part of her daughter is still out there. I remember a gentleman coming in a few minutes after that and telling me that there was a little boy that could really use Emma's heart valves and that it would save his life and if I would consider donating them. Crystal has no idea who he is, but knows he was only a week old. He received um, her heart valves on August 7th, 2000 in Atlanta, Georgia. Emma's death gave him life. I wonder about like his prom and his graduation. I wonder like, is he going off to college right now? She wants to hear his heart beat with the help of Emma's valves. Yeah. Crystal hopes he hears this message and reaches out. He's loved by people that he doesn't even know. And I hope that he has had an incredible life and has got to experience many, many things. And I hope more than anything that he hugs his mama. That's what Emma's mama wants him to know.
Whether you have lived here your whole life or just moved to the Atlanta area, we hear all the time from people curious about the city's history. It's one of the reasons we've launched a new series exploring some of the city's most iconic figures and stories. Tonight, a look at the life of a former Atlanta Falcons coach who butted heads with players, fans, and reporters, all from the perspective of his daughter as she shares artifacts with the NFL to auction during the Super Bowl coming up. Here's Jeff Hollinger with Where We Live. A treasure trove from one of the league's greatest players who served as the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons between 1968 and 1974, Norm Van Brocklin, the Dutchman. I want people to appreciate the goodness of the man. Karen Vanderwijk is the oldest daughter of the legendary quarterback from the University of Oregon. I think a lot of stuff that was written and said about my dad through his playing career and coaching career, there's a lot of inaccuracies. There's a lot of hurtful things that were said that stuck with him. After he died of a heart attack in 1983, his New York Times obituary described him as a stormy figure as a player and a coach, while also highlighting the teams he built coaching the Vikings and Falcons. There was a very deep, profound uh, goodness about him, but he could also have a biting tongue. He told it like he saw it. You know, and not everybody can handle that. He led the NFL in passing three times and in punting twice, appearing in nine Pro Bowls. In 1968, Coach Van Brocklin joined the Falcons, who had only won three games in two expansion seasons. He led the Falcons to their first winning season, 7-6-1 in 1971, and 9-5 in 1973. Then went 2-6, and six, and owner Rankin Smith fired him. So, did Coach Van Brocklin regret coming to Atlanta? No, because I think that was my dad. He felt he could do something really great here in Atlanta. They came very close. Well, tonight, a community in shock after a worker opens fire inside a Rockdale County plant killing a man. What we're learning about the victim and the suspects who police say pulled the trigger. Plus, a state of emergency to help Grady Hospital get back up and running again after major flood damage. Tonight, the state and federal help that is on the way. But first, we are tracking a much improved forecast for the weekend. We have to get through tonight, though, before we can get to that uh, sunshine on the horizon. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb joining us now with a look at what we're seeing outside. Chris? Yeah, it is wet. It is cold. And it's going to remain soggy and chilly during the overnight hours. I'm here with you live on WATL as well as live with my Facebook page on Facebook Live. Hello to you guys on Facebook. Hello to you guys in TV land. We are uh, doing a Facebook Live. Uh, talking to people and they're asking questions about the weather and about this rain. Let me read you a couple of comments here. Dan Shell um, Monchery says, good evening, Chris. Rainy and cold in Decula, Georgia. Uh, Raditha Dempsey says, cold, dreary day, drizzle all day in Bowden. That's over in West Georgia. We have a lot of folks saying hello. David Flatt says hello. So does Barbara Gentry. We have viewers in the Canton area. Great comments coming in right now on Facebook Live. Donna Mathis says, Chris, raining in South Georgia as well. And it's that rain that is to our south that is going to continue moving up into our area here in Atlanta. You can see some of the light and moderate rain. We just had a good shower go over us here in the Midtown area going up 85 right here. That's going to keep pushing up toward the north. So you see the rain here in Atlanta. Also on the north side, north of I-20, pretty good coverage of rain through North Fulton County, up into Forsyth County, Cherokee County, Hall County, over in all of these counties just to the east of the city, down toward uh, the uh, Covington area in Newton County, and then even a better coverage of more moderate rain south and west of the city coming out of LaGrange, uh, Franklin and LaGrange and Hurd and Troop County, moving through Coweta County, Meriwether County. That's going to keep moving up toward the north as well. You can see the flow here coming out of the southwest to the northeast, and we're, take a look at this live right now. You can see what we're watching on the bigger picture. This is our live camera up in Rome where the roads are wet. We have a few more showers that are continuing to come down there in Rome. Once this system, uh, these showers that we have right now, moves on over to the east, we'll finally see the back edge exiting our area. And by tomorrow morning, we'll still have some cloud cover and some uh, pockets of mist and drizzle around. But the good news is the rain will be ending. We'll start to clear out and your weekend will be improving. I'll have more on that specific timing for you coming up in just a few minutes. Meanwhile, join me on my Facebook page, Chris Holcomb 11 Alive on Facebook, and we'll continue our conversation about this weather and what to expect this weekend. All right, Chris, thank you. 
A sad update to a story that many of you have been following on our 11 Alive social media pages. South Fulton police have confirmed that an attorney who disappeared a week ago has died. Officials say 30-year-old Demetrius Allen was involved in a traffic accident in Clayton County just before his family reported him missing. He died a short time later at the hospital. The 30-year-old was in town from Orlando and was last seen a week ago at the 10 ATL lounge on Flat Shoals Road in southeast Atlanta. His family says he was in town for a job interview with Delta Airlines. A man gunned down inside a Conyers plant, and tonight the family of Taurus Andrews wants the world to know about the greatest brother ever. Authorities say Andrews was shot by the suspect who was arrested hours later in Alabama. 11 Alive's Elwin Lopez joins us now. We have an additional caller now advising that somebody has been shot. They'll be directly in front of the main entrance. Captured on this cell phone video, an employee shows us the moment after shots were fired. The shooting happened just before 7 a.m. during a change of shifts at the plant in Conyers this morning. Three minutes later, units swarmed to the area trying to find the suspect and now identified as 18-year-old Cameron Golden, but he was gone. The suspect was last seen running on foot. They advised the shooter ran toward the woods. Instead, they found 42-year-old Taurus Andrews, who had been shot and killed. His sister Sharika says he was a loving person, one of four siblings. It's unclear at this point whether the teen suspect was targeting Andrews. We don't know at this time if he's uh, fired shots at any other individuals. Uh, we're trying to find those answers out from some of the witnesses who were in that building. Hours after the shooting, authorities caught up with Golden in Birmingham, Alabama at a Greyhound bus station. And Andrew's sister tells me her brother and the suspect worked in the same building but wasn't sure whether they knew each other. At this point, still a lot of questions. Why did Golden allegedly shoot Andrews? And was this a targeted attack? Police say at this point they simply don't know. Owen, thank you. There's a new hottest sports ticket in town that begins tonight's speed feed. This weekend, it is all about basketball. The L.A. Lakers will be in town Sunday taking on our Atlanta Hawks. Now, tickets are still available, but you need to be prepared to spend a few bucks. You will pay $115 just for standing room only on Ticketmaster. And third-party sites actually list seats starting around $160, going all the way up to nearly $800 apiece. A happy holiday gift for Gwinnett County teachers. This year, for the first time, the school district will be awarding performance-based bonuses to classroom educators. The superintendent says teachers deserve to be recognized for their outstanding work. In total, more than 3,000 teachers representing 138 schools will receive a bonus. Forbes has released its annual list of the most powerful women in the world. And once again, German Chancellor Angela Merkel comes in at number one. She has earned that honor now nine years in a row. Two Americans also made the top five. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi coming in at number three. And General Motors CEO Mary Barra rounding out the top five. Well, help is on the way now for Grady Hospital. Governor Brian Kemp declared a state of emergency, clearing the way for state and federal dollars. Last weekend, a pipe burst causing major flooding, and the hospital has just started accepting new trauma, stroke, and burn patients today. As 11 Alive's Latasha Givens reports, money and resources are much needed. Grady is incredibly grateful to the governor for declaring an emergency. Doing so unlocks important state and federal resources that will help us move quickly to repair the damage and fully restore the medical care that Atlanta has come to expect from Grady Health System. Grady officials say last week a 24 inch pipe that provides clean water to the air conditioning system burst, flooding the sixth floor and damaging over 200 beds. The hospital was forced to divert incoming patients to other area hospitals, placing an unexpected burden on those facilities. This declaration is absolutely critical to the thousands of patients we treat each day and to the hospitals that voluntarily stretched their own capacity limits this past week in order to care for patients who were temporarily displaced. Officials say repairs could take up to three months, but with the declaration of the state of emergency, Grady will soon receive a 30-bed mobile hospital from North Carolina. The mobile hospital is designed to augment or temporar temporarily replace a medical facility that's been affected by an emergency event. The mobile hospital requested will expand Grady's current capacity. 
Grady officials say they are bringing in a forensic engineer so they can understand exactly what happened to help them determine how to prevent it from happening again. The cold weather and rain did not stop the lines from forming at the new 76 gas station in Swanee this morning. That's because customers were able to take advantage of a big deal, 76 cent gas. Hundreds of people lined Peachtree Industrial Boulevard in hopes of getting some of that cheap gas in their tanks. It was all part of the station's grand opening. Deal seekers told 11 Alive that despite the long lines, the hour long wait was well worth it. Awesome, awesome. It makes me feel awesome. You know, to save that amount of money, it's awesome. I'm number 63. Um, I'm here because I'm on a budget right now, and when gas is less than half the cost of it is everywhere else, it's worth it to come. Uh, amazing. That's definitely a huge blessing to have to just pump for 76 cents versus the 2 and $3 that's been going around now. Certainly a deal there. All is not lost, though, for the folks not able to get the gas. The station also gave away prizes to customers who missed out on the deal. For more on this story, visit mylawrencevillenews.com. Still ahead, a UGA grad student murdered just weeks before his graduation. Next, how another Metro University is honoring him tonight. And if there is weather, you can bet your bottom dollar that Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb is tracking it. He is live on his Facebook page right now, taking a look at your weather and answering your questions. We'll catch up with him after the break. And don't forget, we are streaming right now on 11 Alive's YouTube channel. You can subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. There's more 11 Alive news in primetime coming up after the break. Benjamin Lloyd Clower's name was not announced at the Georgia Tech PhD graduation today, but his presence was felt at the ceremony. Ben will never walk across the stage or receive the diploma he worked so hard towards. He was murdered last month. Caitlin Ross reports his father still attended the graduation today. Very bittersweet. Steve Clower leaned forward in his chair as the graduates crossed the stage. That should have been him someday waiting for a moment that should have been so different. It should have been Ben's moment. At least a little piece of him got to do it. Dr. Christine Young never met Ben, but she brought him with her as she crossed the stage. And they wanted to bring part of Ben here, so they brought a locket with some of his hair in it. I won't ever be able to see Ben walk across that stage but at least I know a little part of them got to. Dr. Young knew this is what Ben wanted most in his life. Their families are friends, and when she heard he was murdered, she wanted to do something, anything to help. Ben was weeks away from graduating from UGA with his master's degree in artificial intelligence. Georgia Tech was his next stop. I feel kind of cheated that this was my son's passion to be here. Ben was quietly brilliant, tutoring kids in his spare time, creating a course at Georgia Tech for high school students interested in robotics. But the way he was killed, 
It was loud. My son was just at home eating dinner, innocent, unarmed, and somebody walked in and murdered him. In the wrenching 911 calls from moments after the shooting, off-duty Madison County Deputy Trey Adams tells police he thought his wife was having an affair with Ben. She was not. Ben's father says she was scared of her husband and came to Ben for help. He wanted to help people. And uh, actually, when this happened to him, he was trying to help a friend. He hopes time will ease his pain, but it may never answer the question, why? He's my best friend, but he respected me as his father. This will be with me the rest of my life. It will never make sense to me. Ben's friends have created an endowment at the University of Georgia to help other students study AI. They have already raised $20,000 in his honor. The suspect in Ben's murder, Trey Adams, will be back in court January 16th. He's charged with murder. Hey everybody, I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Again, you're seeing my phone here in your shot because I'm not only talking to you live here on the ATL, but I'm also on Facebook Live right now um, on my Facebook page, Chris Holcomb 11 Alive. So if you're on Facebook Live, Flip it over to WATL and you can see the weather as well that we're about to do here. And if you're on WATL, go to my Facebook Live and you can see some of the comments that we have coming in here. Um, we have uh, Grace Griffith is watching in Monticello, Georgia. Glenn Knowlton says rain all day, question mark, make it stop. So it's not going to rain all day tomorrow. Glenn and everybody else who's interested, we may have a lingering shower early in the morning and then things start to dry out once we go into the afternoon. Um, oh, and then Michael Druckmann says no meteor shower tonight. There is a meteor shower happening. The problem is we just can't see it because it's going to be cloudy and the rain around. Um, let's see here. One more here. Brandon, Ke Brandon Keeler said, you said about the next system being more powerful. Is it going to be a good soaker? Yes, that's what we're watching coming in right now. The last bit of this rain is over us now. This is going to linger with us as we go through the rest of the overnight hours. We have a good coverage of rain over Metro Atlanta right now. And that's extending up toward the north and east. You can see these showers that have pushed up toward Gainesville around Lake Lanier, Dawson uh, County, over toward Gordon County near the Calhoun area, back toward Bartow County there on the south side, over to the east, good coverage of rain around. And then south of I-20, even more rain with a better coverage of the moderate rain to our south and west. And that's going to keep pushing up toward the north and also to the east. In fact, I'll put this into motion and you can see how these showers have been moving in and it looks like that moderate rain is even expanding a little bit. I also want to take you down here to the north of Macon. Some of you folks on the south side in Upson County and over into Lamar County are experiencing maybe hearing some thunder, seeing some lightning there with that storm that just kind of fired up in uh, Monroe County near Forsyth, Georgia, again, north of Macon that had a lot of lightning with it. So I'm going to keep an eye on that as it moves into uh, parts of Jasper County and Putnam County. You folks might have a little bit of lightning with that. I don't expect any here in the Atlanta area, excuse me, <coughs> in the Atlanta area, any lightning, but we will have that rain. And then eventually this is all going to start pushing out. All right, let's take a look at the bigger picture. I want to show you what we have going on out there as this is a live look down in Coweta County in Noonan. Now what I've done here, I zoomed in close to the road so that you can see a good look at the puddles that we have there on the road and the rain that's coming down into those puddles uh, down in Coweta County. And we've got a pretty good rain rate. Okay, that just kind of smeared a little bit. It'll, this will come back in just a second. It's, I think it's just updating. We've got a bad signal. Oh, there you go. But there you can see uh, some of the raindrops coming down into those puddles. And that's just kind of showing you the rate of rain that we have there in that area. So here, I'm going to go ahead and go past this since it just kind of froze up on us here. Look at these temperatures. We are very chilly. Our high this afternoon was 43. We've actually moved up a degree this evening to 44. We might move up to 45 or 46 during the overnight hours as we see this rain come in. We're going to see more of a southerly flow uh, at the surface rather than that northeasterly flow. And then things will start improving tomorrow. We're going to start off with clouds around and uh, maybe some mist and drizzle still, or a couple of isolated uh, uh, light showers. That's gonna move out. We'll see the clouds decrease, sunshine reappearing by later tomorrow afternoon, and high temperatures rebounding up to 55 degrees. We'll give that an eight on the wasometer on our scale from one to 11. Here's the rain that is over us right now. Watch this as it moves on over to the east, and once we get toward tomorrow morning, we will see the bulk of that rain out of here. Now with the cloud cover, the overcast skies, we'll see a few uh, areas possible with some mist and drizzle that we're going to see. But then once we get toward lunchtime, still some clouds, 
but they start to thin out a little bit. And then in the afternoon, we'll see some holes in those clouds to let more sunshine come in. This latest model updates trying to kick up another shower or two. I really don't think that's going to happen. We'll keep an eye on that, but really we'll see improving weather tomorrow. And then into Sunday, we're going to have a, a few clouds around with more sunshine and this southerly flow helps to warm us up a little bit more. We will be in the lower 60s and even some mid 60s in some spots for your Sunday afternoon. Then the changes come in again. I want you to listen up because on Monday and into Tuesday, uh, we're going to have the potential for some storms out in Mississippi and Alabama on Monday. That system comes into our area late Monday and into Tuesday. But right now, the models are indicating that the chances for stronger storms are going to be more out to the west. We think this will be a little weaker when it moves in here late Monday and into Tuesday. Plan on showers around, maybe some rumbles of thunder and flashes of lightning. But from what we see right now, we don't expect severe weather with that system here in Georgia. If that changes, we will let you know as we go throughout the weekend. So in the morning, still some of those showers are going to be possible here early in the morning. Really just a couple of areas of mist and drizzle. Then uh, everything pushes out. We'll see decreasing clouds. And then on Sunday, looking good, partly cloudy, a 10 on the wasometer. Rain late Monday into Tuesday, maybe some thunder and lightning with that. And then as that clears out, it's going to be really cold Wednesday and Thursday. In the mornings, temperatures will be at 32 Wednesday, 28 Thursday morning. And then by Friday, a few more clouds build in. We'll see some showers developing late with highs right around 54 degrees. Chris, thank you. Last night, former Falcon Michael Vick had one of his biggest rushing records broken. It was done by this guy, Lamar Jackson, uh, with the Baltimore Ravens, and he has taken the lead by storm, certainly with his arm and his legs. Jackson is the latest quarterback to grow up watching number seven in the Georgia Dome and be inspired to change the game just like Vick did. Here's Jeff Hollinger. Lamar keeps. He's got the record. The all-time single season. Rushing record for a quarterback belongs to number eight. NFL executives once thought he should be a wide receiver. Now, Lamar Jackson is on top of the MVP race as a quarterback. I couldn't wish to be any place else. The Baltimore Ravens quarterback broke Michael Vick's single season rushing record with a quick five yard dash during the team's win over the New York Jets. Tame compared to how he's been doing it all season long. Oh, he himself. Look at him turn back and forth. Oh, he broke his ankles. Now he's got an entourage. Jackson has said many times he mirrors the style of Michael Vick, the former number one pick who changed the game with his feet here in Atlanta. Off the play fake, has some running room. Inside the 30, inside the 20, Vick into the end zone, Falcons win. Four quarterbacks in the league today grew up watching Vick and were inspired to play like him. My, my favorite player growing up, um, it's amazing. And I'm going to cherish that forever. And just got to keep it going. You know, records meant to be broken, like he said. There was a time Vic never thought his record of 1,039 yards would ever be broken. Jackson did it with two games left in the regular season. We knew it was coming, man. Like I said, he was the guy for the job. In fact, many of Vic's records have been broken, and with more mobile quarterbacks on the way in the NFL, this could just be the beginning. But no one will ever forget he started it all. And Lamar's stardom has grown within the league as well. After last night's game, check it out, he was signing autographs for players on the opposing team for the Jets. The Ravens are officially AFC North champs, so we will be seeing the Lamar show continue into the postseason. So to come tonight, new details about a notorious serial killer's rampage across the country, one that includes the murder of a father and daughter in Georgia.
It's been 45 years since serial killer Paul John Knowles, or PJK, went on a cross-country murder spree, killing at least 18 people in the span of five months. Now, nearly uncovered tape, newly uncovered tape recordings indicate that the infamous Dozer School may have played a role in his unraveling. If I had to live over again, I wouldn't. He wouldn't do it. I wouldn't live again. Paul John Knowles made kill tapes. He recorded the details of his murders. The tapes were handed over to the court and locked away in Macon. According to investigators, both fire and a flood damaged countless court records. PJK's kill tapes are presumed to be lost forever. But there's a second set of tapes, and for the first time ever, they provided a telling look into the mind of a serial killer in his own words. Paul John Knowles was sent away to the infamous Dozier School for Boys. A 2013 investigation revealed that at least 50 bodies were buried on the grounds of the school. To date, more than 500 former students have alleged brutal beatings and a culture of abuse. It institutionalized him instead of reforming him. He didn't go in a killer. He was just a way we so they got tired of the beatings when he was a youngin and got away from it the best way he knew how at the time. And one thing led to another, one thing led to another. The state of Florida has a hand in this too. How do you mean that before you intended to be shot before? They took him out and killed him. They took him out and killed him. Do you think they planned to do that? We'll let God be the judge of that. We'll let God be the judge of that. Well, from abuse at home to being in and out of reform schools, our 11 Live Team Atticus found even more insight on those tapes. To hear more about what Paul John Knowles had to say and his brother's take on what went wrong, you can head over to the 11 Live YouTube page to watch this full documentary, The Casanova Killer. Up next. People are dying, um, and we're committed to, to helping to find that cause. A view from the front line of the vaping crisis and just what's in those vaping pods. We tested them out. A reveal investigation coming up on prime time on the WATF.
Welcome to The Reveal on Prime Time. I'm investigative reporter Rebecca Lindstrom. The CDC in Atlanta has found itself on the front line, traveling the country, trying to figure out what thousands of illnesses have in common. I sat down to talk with Dr. Brian King about the research. He says whatever triggered this wave of lung injuries, it started around April, and that this epidemic has made us confront the health risks vaping has posed all along. So this investigation is very unique. Typically, when we have these type of outbreak investigations, they are, are the result of some type of infectious agent. In this case, we're dealing with a more chronic disease. It's also complicated by the fact that we have cases in nearly all states. At present, it's looking to be like there's some type of chemical exposure that's primarily related to THC-containing e-cigarette products. Um, there's a lot of solvents and other additives that are added to these products, so it's very difficult for even consumers to know what's in the products. You know, e-cigarette aerosol is not harmless to begin with. E-cigarette aerosol can, can include a harmful uh, ingredients, including nicotine, volatile organic compounds, heavy metals, um, and, and uh, even uh, cancer-causing chemicals. Lungs were designed to, to breathe air. FDA work, they've primarily been working on the, the state, uh, you know, uh, samples of actual products that have been sent in terms of evaluating what are the ingredients in these products. Um, for CDC's part, we've been dealing a lot of the, the boots on the ground in terms of working with the states and the self-reported data and some of the clinical symptoms. We have thousands of people that are affected by a severe lung injury and people are dying um, and we're committed to, to helping to find that cause. While the FDA tests vape pods from those critically ill, we decided to find out what was inside some of the common products available right now to anyone, anywhere. Just call it a buzz. It usually relaxes me somewhat. Andrea Burns started vaping <coughs> when she was underage. When I was in school, they were doing it because it was trendy. Just like, oh, wow, like I'm drooling and oh, look at the flavors. The 19-year-old is like many people who vape. I think they're safer, yes, <laughs> far safer. She believes vaping is safer than smoking cigarettes. You just can't buy off the street. These are some of the products cops have seized off the streets. They call them adulterated e-cigarettes containing THC. It's the type of product health officials believe is key to recent illnesses. But what about the mainstream store-bought products? Besides what's listed on the packaging, we wanted to know what's in this stuff. I'm not exactly sure. There may be something I don't know about. To find out, we bought six different vaping liquids and commissioned a lab in Oregon to analyze them. Light-scale labs tested for 130 common and problematic chemicals, including pesticides and carcinogens, and found these five products pass government standards. But this one, mango CBD, did not actually contain any CBD, but it did contain lead. There is no national standard for a safe amount of lead in vaping products, but California regulators have set their own limit. Our sample tested 800 times over that limit. The company couldn't be reached for comment. Lead inhaled into the lung is a potential carcinogen that it can cause cancer. That's Cook Children's pediatric pulmonologist, Dr. Karen Schultz. She's the doctor who treated Tristan Zofield, who you may remember is the North Texas teen seen here <coughs> fighting for his life as a result of vaping. We took the lab test results to Dr. Schultz to find out what they mean. I think one of the bigger questions when you look at the ingredients of the vaping liquid is what happens when it gets heated as well. We don't know what happens to all those chemicals when they get heated and then inhaled. We asked Juul about that. The company says product quality and safety are of paramount importance and said they use third-party labs to perform chemical testing on every lot of e-liquid. Researchers in Oregon, though, have studied what happens to liquid from a Juul pod when it's heated and vaporized. That study determined that Juul vapors are in fact damaging to cells, emphasizing the need to determine if Juul products will lead to adverse health effects with chronic use. Does that make you want to stop vaping? 
I'm gonna be honest, probably not, because you know, it was my choice to begin with, you know. I realized the dangers, you know. Well, there's been a focus on THC containing vape products during this outbreak. The CDC says 13% of patients insist they only used nicotine-based products. Are you concerned your teen is vaping? Not sure what to do about it? The Partnership for Drug-Free Kids has created a guide for parents to figure out what they're vaping and how to talk about it. We have posted it on our website, 11alive.com. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. We've been focusing on this rain that's continuing to move through. It's got uh, some light rain, moderate rain, a few pockets of heavy rain too. I want to take you down though to the south. This is just to the north of Macon where we see this one cell here that has a good bit of lightning with it. Uh, that's just north of Macon. It went through uh, Monroe County near Forsyth, Georgia, and is now over near Gray uh, Gray County or Gray, Georgia near Jones County. Um, we're also watching some of this lightning though extending up into parts of uh, Jasper County just to the south of Monticello. So I want you folks who are watching here around Monticello and over toward Eatonton to know that this system is pushing up toward the north and east. Let me put this into motion for you because I want to I want you to see this is for the past two hours and you can see how that cell moved just north of Macon. It's still holding together pretty well with that lightning. So it's going to clip the southern parts of uh, Jasper County and move into the uh, Putnam County area around Eatonton. Here's Lake Oconee right there. We'll see if that lightning extends into Lake Oconee or Lake Sinclair right there on the Baldwin County line. But that's the strongest cell we have, and that's the only lightning that we have closest to us right now. Meanwhile, around Metro Atlanta and North Georgia, we see more of this rain that is down to the south. It's going to continue moving up into our area tonight. And once this finally moves through, we'll see some improving weather during the day tomorrow. Here's another live look outside right now. We've been keeping you uh, posted on some of our different cameras uh, throughout the evening hours. This is in Athens. The roads are wet. We have more rain that is coming down in Athens right now, not torrential heavy downpours, but just some good showers that are moving through. That severe weather threat, even though we're seeing some lightning there uh, near Jasper County, moving closer to Putnam County, we don't think that's going to be severe. The severe weather threat is down in South Georgia and into the northern parts of Florida, and that's where we think that that severe weather threat is going to stay for the rest of the nighttime hours. Meanwhile, temperatures are still cool. We're 44. We actually have moved up one degree since our high today was 43. We've moved up a degree this evening, and it may even move up another degree or two overnight as we see these showers move through. So I know you're tired of the rain and the cold air. We have some improvements coming in for the weekend. We're going to time that out for you in just a few minutes. There was nothing done wrong to use the power of impeachment on this nonsense is an embarrassment to this country. President Trump reacting quickly to today's House Judiciary Committee vote approving two articles of impeachment against him. After 14 hours of debate yesterday, the vote fell along party lines, 23 Democrats for and 17 Republicans against. Next week, for only the third time in U.S. history, the House of Representatives will be voting on articles of impeachment against a president. Meanwhile, Democratic presidential hopefuls are gearing up for next week's sixth Democratic debate in Los Angeles. Andrew Yang is the last of the seven candidates who made the cut. However, late today, all seven threatened to boycott the debate over a labor dispute. Progressive Senators Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders tweeted their support for Unite Here Local 11, and the other candidates followed suit soon after. The labor union says it represents cooks, dishwashers, servers, and cashiers on the Leola Marymount University campus. The candidates say they won't cross the union's picket lines. The Democratic National Committee has already been forced to move the debate once after concerns from workers at UCLA. There are plans for four more debates in January and February. One of those will be hosted February 19th in Las Vegas by NBC, MSNBC, and the Nevada Independent. That's going to happen three days before the state's caucus. Let's get now some perspective on the state of Georgia's politics from Meet the Press moderator Chuck Todd. He uh, will keep hearing about Georgia being a purple state and Democrats expressing confidence here for 2020. So, Chuck, with both Senators David Perdue and Senator-designate Kelly Loeffler up for re-election or up for election, rather, in 2020, do Democrats in Georgia try to take out both or focus their energy on Loeffler, who might be an easier target? Anytime I think I've covered, oh, I want to say eight different um, Senate uh, campaigns where there were 
two going on at the same time. And rarely does a party that is trying to win at least one of them successfully win them both and successfully target them both. Usually, unless it's a wave election, do you see the opportunity for one party to successfully target both. So that isn't what's going to happen. It is going to be the short seat um, uh, that, that gets targeted, not David Perdue uh, in, in this sense of the word. And so, yes, expect that. That doesn't mean that Perdue's going to get off scot-free. Don't get me wrong. But the money will be directed more uh, at Loeffler than it will be at Purdue. Chuck will have much more on the week in Washington, including a look at the upcoming House debate on articles of impeachment against President Trump. That is Sunday morning on Meet the Press right here on 11 Alive. You can also head to the politics section of the 11alive.com website for uh, continuing updates on the local, state, and national political stories that impact you and your family. It has been seven years since a gunman attacked a preschool in Sandy Hook, Connecticut, a school weather there. Coming up, what the families left behind have accomplished since that dreadful day. marks seven years since the horrific shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary in Connecticut. Tonight, there's new hope as a group founded by Newtown parents has opened the first crisis center of its kind to prevent other school tragedies. NBC's Kate Snow has the first look. No, nobody gets in trouble. We're just here to help gather information, okay? Tucked away in this Miami office. I just wanted to make sure that someone spoke to him. Every beep is another tip coming in. There's an immense power here because they're saving lives and intervening right now as we stand here. 
Nicole Hockley is a co-founder of Sandy Hook Promise, and this is the first national crisis center focused on school safety. School districts in 21 states are training students to use the program Say Something. They can submit a tip anonymously, online, by phone, or most popular, through a mobile app. It's about preventing a disaster in school instead of reacting to one. This is about how you change a culture to really look out for each other and giving the kids the control over their environment and what they do versus saying that this is an unsafe environment and you need to practice running and hiding. This is a tip you got last month? Yes. About a potential school shooting? Yes. Saying that they're extremely afraid to come to school because of this threat. Jessica Neely is the crisis center manager. Since opening in September, her counselors have handled more than 5,000 tips, responding within seconds, connecting with the school and authorities as needed. The tipster says here, thank you so much for letting me talk to you. If I find anything else out, I will let you know. That shows that they trust the system. Yes. You're doing a really good job right now. Do you know One of the most common tips, like students worried a friend might hurt themselves. Them. Where's the razor right now? Hockley believes the Sandy Hook shooting, where she lost her six-year-old Dylan, might have been prevented if someone had spoken up. I made a promise to him seven years ago um, that I would do everything I could to honor his legacy and to prevent school shootings going forward, and this is part of honoring that promise, saving others' lives in his name. No, this saving lives by teaching students to say something. Well, I know many of you are hearing it outside your window, maybe hearing that rain hitting your roof. We have a good coverage of rain over us right now, and it's more than just mist and drizzle. We have some areas of light rain and then a pretty good coverage of moderate rain out there, too, and a few pockets of heavy rain. Here's how it's looking. L let's start here in Atlanta, where we see a lot of yellow and orange indicating the moderate rain that is covering us up here over all of the metro Atlanta counties. A little lighter activity back into West Georgia and up toward Rome. I've just checked our tower cam. We're really not seeing much in Rome right now at all falling from the sky, even though the roads are still wet. But you can see how this moisture is moving up toward the north and the east, and you can see those pockets of more moderate rain, and that's going to keep moving up into <coughs> excuse me, areas of northeast Georgia. I was trying to suppress that cough. It just didn't work there. Moving up into northeast Georgia. And then down on the south side, there's even more rain that's coming in down toward LaGrange, Meriwether County, Coweta County, Pike Lamar County, Spalding County. So this all still has to move through our area, uh, continuing through the rest of the overnight hours tonight. I'm going to put this into motion, and you can see that flow coming in from the southwest, moving to the northeast. Those are the individual showers, but I also want you to notice that the back edge of this is also moving over to the east. So that's showing the progress of this rain and how it's going to be moving out as we go through the overnight hours. It's going to shift over to the east as these individual showers are going to be coming in from the south and the west. Take a look at this uh, on the full screen right now, and you can see what we're watching. This is a look uh, down at SunTrust Park at the uh, Christmas tree there and under the Atlanta Braves sign. And it is wet. The sidewalks are wet. We have some raindrops there that you can see there in those puddles with that rain that is coming down at this hour. So it is a soggy night. It's also a chilly night out there. Here's the high resolution rapid refresh model, and this shows kind of what we're going to be watching with the future radar with these showers moving through. Still some pockets of moderate to heavy rain overnight, but you see how that back edge of the rain is going to keep moving on out and pushing away from us. And so by tomorrow morning, there may be just a couple little lingering showers around in the morning or some mist or drizzle, but for the most part, the rain is going to be ending and then we'll see improving weather as we go through the rest of the day here on Saturday with the clouds slowly breaking up and giving us a little bit of sunshine to come through. We've been watching these temperatures that have been holding in the 40s for much of the day. Right now we've moved up one degree from our high this afternoon of 43. It's now 44 degrees. We've got 43 in Duluth, 43 in Athens. Pretty uniform temperatures all around. We're not seeing a wide range in those temperatures out there at this hour, thanks to the cloud cover and the rain and the high moisture content in the air right now. Tomorrow, it gets better. We're going to go with an 8 on the wasometer. That's our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. High temperatures get up to 55 degrees. You're going to wake up in the morning and look and see the clouds and maybe some mist and drizzle and think, oh, man, another bad day. Well, no. It's going to be getting better as we go through the rest of the afternoon. We'll see those clouds breaking up and some sunshine. This is the last, last batch of that concentrated area of rain that will keep moving on over to the east. So in the morning, 
or if you're getting up at seven, you're gonna start off with those clouds around and even some pockets of light rain or mist and drizzle still lingering around. But look at this. Once we get toward the lunchtime hour, those clouds break up a little bit more. We'll see some sunshine coming through. And then in the afternoon, a mixture of sunshine and clouds, but we think we're going to be rain free into those afternoon hours and then moving into Sunday. It's going to be another nice day starting off with a few clouds, but more sunshine and then look at the southerly flow that's going to bring in some even warmer air. So we get up to 55 tomorrow and then 61 for high temperature on Sunday. Then look at this late Sunday. You see some clouds coming in from the west. Well, that's the next system that we're watching and this one we have to watch very closely because on Monday, the system's going to be a little better organized out to the west in Alabama and Mississippi. They have more instability. They have more shear over there for Monday and Tuesday, and there's the potential for some strong storms over on the west uh, west of us on Monday. As those showers move in here late Monday and into Tuesday, the way it looks from the modeling right now is that we're going to have some rain and we may have some thunder and lightning, but we think the ingredients needed for strong storms are going to be lower here than they are out to the west. So yeah, it's still going to be soggy here on Tuesday, uh, Monday into Tuesday with some thunder and lightning possible. But from what we're seeing right now, we don't think we'll have widespread severe weather, whereas they might have a higher chance for stronger storms in Mississippi and Alabama. So we'll keep an eye on that. If those ingredients start coming back up, we'll let you know to be prepared for that as we go into Monday and Tuesday. But for right now, I just don't want you to panic about that, uh, but just be aware of it as things may be changing a little bit. And then going into Wednesday, that northerly flow comes in. That's going to cool us down for the middle of the week. It's also going to dry us out too. So here's the forecast through the rest of the extended period 55 for a high Saturday uh, clearing skies sunshine returning in the afternoon Sunday partly cloudy a little warmer at 61 and then Monday the rain comes in late maybe a few thunder showers into early on Tuesday that ends later in the day it gets cooler at 59 for a high Tuesday chilly on Wednesday morning down to 32 Thursday morning down to 28 and then Friday back to 54 for a high with about a 30 percent chance for a shower for the end of the week.
All right, guys, you may have to give it up. Former Braves third baseman has just won son of the year. We're talking about Josh Donaldson. He gave his mother an early Christmas present. Check this out. <laughs> Quite the reaction there. That surprise, that white Maserati that he just drove up in the car. Actually, a little more than just a Christmas gift. The MLB Twitter account posted uh, that he promised to give his mom that car if she quit smoking. He would get her that Maserati, and it looks like he came through on that promise. A lot of people commenting on the video. A little negative there, saying she's probably going to pick the habit back up again, but you got to <laughs> keep trying if you do. But if you ever needed some motivation, that Maserati might be just the ticket for it. I'm sure that he had a deal. It's like, if you start smoking again, I I'm taking this car back. Yeah. You know uh -huh. what I mean? So she better Why not start not? smoking again. Way to go, though. Yeah. All right, 55 for a high tomorrow. That rain is going to be pushing out overnight. A lingering Light shower possible in the morning, maybe some mist and drizzle, but then the clouds move out, sunshine returns, partly cloudy Sunday and warmer up to 61. Rain and maybe a couple thunder showers late Monday into early Tuesday. Then it gets cold in the middle of the week. All right, Chris, thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. There's more news and weather coming up here on the ATI. Eleven Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. And good evening to you. I'm Faith Abube. A father of five and successful business owner killed his wife at his side during that attempted robbery back in 1996 and now nearly 24 years later. 
A Gwinnett County jury on Thursday found the gunman guilty of murder. Joe Henke is in the newsroom for us tonight. And Joe, why did it take nearly two decades to close this case? Well, Faith, Gwinnett County prosecutors tell us back in 1996, the gunman admitted to his roommate about killing the victim in this case, but he then left the country until recently being detained and extradited back to the U.S. last year. In 1996, those who knew six-year-old business owner Adalberto Salinas said he lived to support his family. He was a very, very fine gentleman, a hard worker, family man, somebody that you were proud to know. Burton Hazelriggs owned a store next to Salinas' western shop in Chambly. On the weekend, Salinas worked at a second business he owned. It was his custom to work here at the Buford Highway Flea Market Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And yesterday at 7 o'clock after closing, Mr. Salinas and his wife headed for home, stopping along the way for a bite to eat. On January 21st, 1996, the couple stopped for a Sunday tradition, a meal at Shoney's on Indian Trail off 85 in Gwinnett County. They returned home around 9 p.m., and then a gunman tried forcing his way into the house. Mr. Salinas um, uh, put up a uh, scuffle. The lone gunman uh, fired several shots. Detectives found shell casings by the front door and said one of the shots hit and killed Salinas, and then the shooter took off. A lone gunman uh, wearing a uh, dark clothes and a black mask. That's the only description police have released of the killer. If they know more, whether or not he was driving a vehicle, and what might be the motive for the shooting, detectives have not said. This week at trial, Gwinnett County prosecutors said Salinas was known to keep a large amount of cash. And the day after the shooting, a person contacted detectives, said a Hector Garay admitted to killing Salinas and added Garay had tried to recruit him to help with the robbery. Police could not find Garay, though. Prosecutors say he left behind his two children and common-law wife, headed to Texas and eventually his home country of El Salvador. Garay lived there for 22 years until he was detained last year trying to cross the border from El Salvador into Honduras. Garay was then extradited back here to Georgia. Prosecutors tell us at trial this week, Garay testified he was framed back in 1996 and witnesses threatened to kill him and his son if he spoke about the murder. He also claimed at trial he had mental health problems. A jury, though, found Garay guilty of murder yesterday. He'll be sentenced in early January. Faith. All right, thank you so much, Joe. A sad update tonight to a story we first brought you this week. South Fulton Police confirming the attorney who disappeared a week ago has died. Police say the 30-year-old Demetrius Allen was in a car accident in Clayton County just before his family reported him missing. He died a short time later at the hospital. Allen was in town here from Orlando and had been with friends at 10 ATL Lounge in Southeast Atlanta before that car crash. His family says he was in town for a job interview with Delta Airlines. It's been a wet and dreary 24 hours through our Metro Atlanta 11 Alive Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb is in the Weather Center for us tonight. And Chris, lots of holiday plans this weekend. Are we staying in or coming out? <laughs> we're going to see some improvements. I think you're going to like it as we head into the weekend, as we're going to see these temperatures that will warm up a little bit. And the rain is finally going to end. But I know you're going to have to deal with this still for a while longer tonight and during the overnight hours. Take a look at what we're watching on radar right now. See all the yellow and orange? That's indicating a little more mild moderate rain. We've got a pretty widespread coverage of that moderate rain out there tonight. The green surrounding that is the lighter rain that extends up to the north and east up toward around the Gainesville area into Dawson County, Forsyth County, Gwinnett County, move down to the south through Atlanta. Good moderate rain there and still more of this on the south side coming up from Coweta County down toward Troop County, also Meriwether County, Pike and Lamar counties, and that continues to feed up into this direction. We were watching this cell a little bit earlier north of Macon had a lot of lightning with it. It's now over into Putnam County. We don't see any additional lightning with it now. That's weakening as it moves on over to the east. As we put this into motion, you can see that flow continues coming up out of the southwest and moving to the northeast. That's the individual cells. But then look at this. The back edge of the rain is cleared through parts of uh, West Georgia there around the Rome area. That's going to push over to the east tonight and eventually we will see these showers ending as we go through the overnight hours and toward tomorrow morning. Here's what we're watching out there right now as you take a look at the bigger picture. This is a live look in Coweta County. We still have rain coming down there in the Noonan area. This is a live look at the courthouse. We've been watching this street here and some of the raindrops where you can kind of see the rate of rain as those raindrops are falling there in those puddles. Now you can see this area of rain coming through tonight, but there goes that back edge by tomorrow morning. A couple of lingering light showers are possible or some mist and drizzle, but then things improve for the rest of the day with clouds moving out. And yeah, we'll even see some sunshine later in the day on Saturday. I'll let you know if that will continue into Sunday. We'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. 
Well, tonight, a family in mourning after a man was gunned down on the job by his co-worker. County is requesting that we assist and reference our active shooter. Confirm shell cases in front of the break room area. Confirm shell cases. It's a male that's been shot in the abdomen. Well, those shots were fired just before shift change this morning. An employee shared the cell phone video with us. It shows the emergency response at the Dark Container Corporation in Rockdale County. The big question tonight is why? Why did the 18 year old suspect walk into that plant and kill Taurus Andrews? And that's the question his family also wants answered tonight. Alumni Elias Owen Lopez has a story from Conyers. His sister Sharika says Taurus Andrews was her little brother, one of four siblings, a loving person and so full of life. I want to read some of her statement to you. She said, quote, he had no kids of his own, but loved his nieces and nephews, adding that he was the type of person that you would want to be your friend. Taurus Andrews was 42 years old. His sister tells us he had only worked at the plant for a little over a year, and this morning, authorities say he was shot and killed by a temporary employee. The victim sisters say they worked in the same building, but she wasn't sure whether the suspect and the victim knew each other. Now, I want to take you back to earlier today when authorities got a call right before 7 a.m. about an active shooter situation at the Dart Container Corporation in Conyers. Units arrived within about just three minutes and went in to look for the suspect, now identified as 18-year-old Cameron Golden. A truck driver told them, the authorities, that he had seen a man fleeing the scene. Now, authorities found a man, now identified as the victim, Taurus Andrews, who had had been shot. Police evacuated more than 30 employees via school buses to a nearby Baptist church. At this time, police aren't sure how the suspect was able to flee the scene. We don't know at this time if he's uh, fired shots at any other individuals. Uh, we're trying to find those answers out from some of the witnesses who were in that building. Now, they were able to track down Golden at a Greyhound bus station in Birmingham, Alabama, but still, there are a lot of questions here. We don't know what exactly led up to that shooting, and we're still trying to learn that information. As soon as we get it, we'll bring it to you in the upcoming hours and on 11 Alive app. Well, tonight, help is on the way for Grady Hospital patients. Governor Brian Kemp declared a state of emergency, clearing the way for the state and federal dollars to help the hospital recover from a major flooding. Now, you might remember last weekend, a pipe burst there, causing some major damage. As 11 Alive's Latasha Givens reports, Grady has now started accepting new trauma, stroke, and burn patients. Grady is incredibly grateful to the governor for declaring an emergency. Doing so unlocks important state and federal resources that will help us move quickly to repair the damage and fully restore the medical care that Atlanta has come to expect from Grady Health System. Grady officials say last week a 24 inch pipe that provides clean water to the air conditioning system burst, flooding the sixth floor and damaging over 200 beds. The hospital was forced to divert incoming patients to other area hospitals, placing an unexpected burden on those facilities. This declaration is absolutely critical to the thousands of patients we treat each day and to the hospitals that voluntarily stretched their own capacity limits this past week in order to care for patients who were temporarily displaced. Officials say repairs could take up to three months, but with the declaration of the state of emergency, Grady will soon receive a 30-bed mobile hospital from North Carolina. The mobile hospital is designed to augment or temporary, temporarily replace a medical facility that's been affected by an emergency event. The mobile hospital requested will expand Grady's current capacity. Police have arrested Jose Rivera for allegedly killing a man at a home in Suwannee earlier this week. They say Rivera shot Christopher Morand at a house party. Witnesses there told police that the shooting stemmed from a fight between Morand and several other people who were there. There's still no word yet on a motive. And a radio personality has filed a lawsuit against a former Atlanta police officer for allegedly tasing her during a routine traffic stop. Cree Montague works for Hot 107.9, and she says that she got pulled over for not signaling during a lane change on I-20. Well, she says the officer, Officer Lemuel Gardner, who didn't turn his body camera on during this incident, tased her during that traffic stop. He told his superiors essentially that his sensibilities were offended. 
and she didn't show due deference for his authority. I want this to not happen to anyone else, um, especially being from Atlanta. This shouldn't happen, and I don't want it to happen again, ever, anywhere. Well, that police officer did resign from his position almost immediately after an investigation started into his actions. The reckless driving charge against Montague was later dismissed. A UGA grad student murdered just weeks before his graduation. Next, how another Metro Atlanta University is honoring him tonight. Benjamin Lloyd Clore's name wasn't announced at the Georgia Tech PhD graduation today, but his presence was definitely felt there at that ceremony. Ben will never walk across the stage or receive a diploma he worked so hard towards. He was murdered just last month. Caitlin Ross says that his dad still attended graduation today. Very bittersweet. Steve Clower leaned forward in his chair as the graduates crossed the stage. That should have been him someday. Waiting for a moment that should have been so different. It should have been Ben's moment. At least a little piece of him got to do it. Dr. Carol Christine Young. Dr. Christine Young never met Ben, but she brought him with her as she crossed the stage. And they wanted to bring part of Ben here, so they brought a locket with some of his hair in it. I won't ever be able to see Ben walk across that stage, but at least I know a little part of him got to. Dr. Young knew this is what Ben wanted most in his life. Their families are friends, and when she heard he was murdered, she wanted to do something, anything to help. Ben was weeks away from graduating from UGA with his master's degree in artificial intelligence. Georgia Tech was his next stop. I feel kind of cheated that this was my son's passion to be here. Ben was quietly brilliant, tutoring kids in his spare time, creating a course at Georgia Tech for high school students interested in robotics. But the way he was killed, it was loud. My son was just at home eating dinner, innocent, unarmed, and somebody walked in and murdered him. In the wrenching 911 calls from moments after the shooting, off-duty Madison County Deputy Trey Adams tells police he thought his wife was having an affair with Ben. She was not. Ben's father says she was scared of her husband and came to Ben for help. He wanted to help people. And uh, actually, when this happened to him, he was trying to help a friend. He hopes time will ease his pain, but it may never answer the question, why? He's my best friend, but he respected me as his father. This will be with me the rest of my life. It will never make sense to me. Well, Ben's friends have created an endowment at UGA to help other students. They've also raised about $20,000 in his honor. The suspect in Ben's murder, Trey Adams, will be back in court January 16th. 
All right, if you're tired of this lingering rainy and cold weather we've had the last 24 hours, meteorologist Chris Holcomb has some news for you, at least on the wet part. It's some good news, right? Yeah, it is some good news. We're finally going to see a break in this action, and we're already seeing the rain ending over parts of West Georgia, especially Northwest. In Rome, the rain is over for you. We've got this back edge that's nearing the Atlanta area. I want to take you down first, though. I know you see all this rain here around Metro Atlanta. Let me take you down there to the south, though, because we're watching a little bit of lightning. This is near Macon and just north of Macon. We have one lone lightning strike here back into parts of Lamar County near Barnesville. So folks on the south side, just don't be surprised if you see some lightning from a distance or maybe hear some thunder with these showers and storms that are around Macon and just north of Macon. We had a couple of those earlier in Jasper County that moved up into Putnam. This is a lot weaker now and doesn't have any lightning in association with it. Back in Atlanta and most of the metro area, we don't see any lightning here, but this is a good coverage of rain. And we're talking moderate rain, pretty persistent periods of moderate rain that are moving through. On the north side, this is pushing up into parts of White County, Hall County through Forsyth County, moving on up into areas of Banks County, getting closer to uh, the Rabin County area. This stretches down along the 985 and 85 corridor into Atlanta on the north side there in uh, Fulton County, Cobb County. We're seeing this back edge come through Paulding. That's a good thing. And then more of this rain that is down to the south through parts of Coweta County, Fayette County, Clayton, Henry counties, down toward Pike and Lamar, Upson County, and over toward LaGrange too. And this is where that heavier rain is coming from. It is moving from the southwest, pushing up toward the northeast. So those are the individual cells. However, I want you to also notice the back edge of this is also pushing over over to the east. So we're going to be watching this progress into an easterly direction. And with that happening, that means this rain will eventually be ending during the overnight hours. So take a look at the big picture. Let me show you what else we're watching out there, where you can see that moisture that is down to the south along the Gulf Coast region and in South Georgia. And, and see some of that lightning with that, even here around Macon and southward, where they see some of those uh, thunderstorms there. But it looks like they'll stay below severe criteria. If you're looking for severe weather, it's down in far south Georgia and in parts of northern Florida. In fact, there's a slight risk that yellow color is where there that's a level two out of five risk for a few isolated stronger storms that will take place. We have some cold air here in place right now. Our high in the afternoon hours was 43 degrees. We've actually moved up one degree this evening at 44. And we see pretty uniform temperatures all around Metro Atlanta mainly in those mid 40s, some lower 40s right now in Covington. We'll be at about 44 for a low in the morning, so we'll see these temperatures pretty much holding steady and they get up to 55 in the afternoon. Now when you wake up, you're still going to have some clouds around early in the morning, maybe some areas of mist and drizzle or a lingering light shower, but that's all going to be moving out and then eventually we'll see the clouds breaking up during the day. So on our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day, we're going to go with an 8. Did you see that? Watch that rain get out of here for the overnight hours in the morning. Uh, overcast when you wake up, so you might wake up thinking, man, I thought it was supposed to be better today. Well, just hold on. It's going to get better during the day on Saturday. See how these clouds break up around lunchtime with some sun coming through, and then in the afternoon, a mixture of sunshine and clouds, temperatures back into the 50s, and then on Sunday, looking good with some sunshine, mixing in with a few clouds, but that southerly flow brings in even some warmer air, and for Sunday afternoon, we're into the lower 60s, and then even warmer on Monday up to 67, but we have another system moving in, That'll have some rain with it, maybe even some thunder and lightning. We really think the a better severe weather chance or the higher severe weather chance will be to the west of us on Monday into Tuesday. We'll just have general showers here and some thunder possible and then drying out, but really cold Wednesday and Thursday down to 28 Thursday morning. We're back to 54 Friday, but more clouds build in and we'll have another chance for some showers. Well, Christmas came early for some Gwinnett County teachers this year. For the first time, the school district will be awarding performance based bonuses to classroom educators. The superintendent says teachers, they deserve to be recognized for the outstanding work they do all year round. In total, more than 3,000 teachers representing 138 schools will receive a bonus. I'm Francesca Amaker with the A Scene, and guess what movie comes out today? Jumanji, the next level, and parts of the film were shot right here in Georgia.
All right, folks, you know what time it is. You see your screen. It is time for Friday's edition of the A scene. And today is the day. It's the day we've all been waiting for. Jumanji, the next level is out today and it was filmed right here in Georgia. And of course, we've got a sneak peek for you. We're in the wrong body. My joints feel like butter. Oh, no. I will lose myself. This can't be happening! I came back and things actually got worse. Things actually got worse. I love it. Okay, so in Jumanji, the next level, the gang is back, but the game has changed. As Kevin Hart, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and Jack Black return to rescue one of their own. Now, the players will have to brave parts of unknown from arid deserts to snowy mountains to escape the world's most dangerous game. Ooh. And keep in mind, the cast was filming the movie in downtown Noonan, as you see from the photos here, also at Pinewood Studios back in February and March of this year. In fact, back in March, I interviewed the rock about another movie he was here promoting and I asked him about Jumanji the next level what has been the most fun thing about shooting during the one week that you guys have filmed Jumanji 2 here in Atlanta oh god the the most fun thing is just honestly just being on set so it was nice to come back here to Atlanta and get the crew back and get the family back and Kevin is great he's literally my brother and Jack Black and Karen Gillan and Nick Jonas and now Danny DeVito and Danny Glover and Aquafina, Aquafina yeah. oh my god yeah so it's it's great and we all love Atlanta I bet he does. He loves eating here too, guys. Uh, next up, let's catch a casting for a new music video being shot by rapper Drake and Atlanta's own Future. The casting call is next week, so you must be available on the 17th and 18th of December. Casting directors are looking for kitchen staff who look like chefs ages 20 to 40 years old, men and women, that's cool. They're also seeking phone store patrons, any ethnicity, men and women, no visible tattoos. You get paid 200 bucks and get to work with the best in the game. Head on over to 11alive.com slash the A-Scene. We've already put the submission details smack dab right there. And as always, while you're there, peruse around. Stay for a while. See what's filming in your neck of the woods. And always follow us on Instagram at the A-Scene 11. It's been seven years since a gunman attacked a preschool in Sandy, Sandy Hook, Connecticut. And coming up, we have details on what the families left behind have been doing and what they've accomplished since that dreadful day.
He's only 21 years old, a college student and working at a new job to help his mom pay the bills. But that didn't stop Jason Murphy from stepping in to help other families in need, giving their kids a Christmas. He tells our Deborah Tuff why he wants people to follow his lead and pay it forward. My paychecks don't even count the thousands. A junior adult in state, Jason Murphy says he did not grow up with much. Growing up, Christmas kind of, you know, it means a lot to kids. And when parents get into those financial situations like I was when I was younger, um, it's something you can't really explain to children. In fact, just last Christmas, the Rome, Georgia native almost didn't have one. I ended up taking two paychecks for my last job and put them together and kind of like bought some Christmas gifts for different family members. So when he heard co-workers mention what one mom was going to do for her kids Christmas. She came up with the idea to make a uh, slime for her kids for Christmas. I was like, well, that's kind of cool. And then they were like, but that's all she's doing. Because financially, that's all she can do. So Jason said he wanted to do much more, even if he doesn't have much. Asking around, he researched and ended up starting a casual conversation with the mom, finding out what her kids liked. She was like, oh, well, you know, my daughter's always one of these Barbie Malibu houses. Then he found out about another family who needs help. They have a little boy who likes animals. He bought themed toys. Like a veterinary thing with these small little animals, like a vet shop or whatever. The families don't know Murphy is buying gifts. Friends will deliver them, but on Christmas morning, two families, a handful of kids, will believe in the magic of Christmas. I want other people to join in and talk around. You know, there's always somebody that could use, you know, a little push or a little help. And Jason hopes to buy a few more gifts really for the parents with, with his next paycheck. Can really Only for the third time in U.S. history, the House of Representatives will be voting on articles of impeachment against the president. The House Judiciary Committee approved the charges against President Donald Trump today after 14 hours of debate yesterday. NBC's Alice Barr is in Washington with reaction and the next steps. Ms. Jackson Lee. Aye. With an historic party line vote, 23 Democrats in favor. Aye. And 17 Republicans opposed. My vote is no. The House Judiciary Committee approves two articles of impeachment against President Trump. He betrayed the nation. Uh, he moved us toward a corrupt elections. Uh, and uh, he abused his power. Today's vote an exercise in efficiency after two days of sprawling and fiery debate running late into the night. I would like for the Does sake the of history, wish to be I'd like for the sake of history, the chairman. The articles accuse President Trump of abusing his power by trying to leverage Ukraine's military aid in exchange for announcing politically motivated investigations and then obstructing Congress by blocking witnesses and defying subpoenas. Republicans insisting the president did nothing wrong. For Democrats, impeachment is their drug, it is their obsession, it is their total focus. President Trump meeting with the president of Paraguay today and touting a new trade agreement with China, claiming impeachment has been good for him. Fundraising for the Republican Party has gone through the roof. We're setting records. We've never, nobody's ever seen anything like it because the people are disgusted. The president already looking ahead to a Republican-run Senate trial, during which Majority Leader Mitch McConnell promises he'll coordinate closely with the White House. There's no chance the president's going to be removed from office. To come out and say he's closely coordinating with the chief defendant, the White House, and that he has already decided that it's not going to happen. I think that is an outrage. Democrats and Republicans bitterly polarized as the final question on whether to impeach President Trump heads to the House floor next week. Well, the former governor of Kentucky, Matt Bevin, is facing a lot of backlash for pardoning or commuting the sentences of hundreds of people, including murderers and rapists. And now the sister of one of the murder victims says Bevin can, quote, rot in hell. Here's NBC's Pete Alexander. Tonight, just days after leaving office, former Kentucky Governor Matt Bevin is under fire for issuing 428 pardons and commutations, according to the Louisville Courier Journal. Among those Bevin pardoned, a man convicted of raping a nine-year-old child, another who hired a hitman to kill his business partner, a man who killed his parents, and a man who beheaded a woman before stuffing her in a barrel. Governor Bevin's pardons show what is a shocking lack of judgment 
and potentially an abuse of our system of justice. Most of those impacted low-level drug offenders, but also pardoned Patrick Brian Baker, set free this week, two years into a 19-year sentence for a home invasion where Baker shot and killed Donald Mills, whose sister is furious. Pissed off. I'm not going to lie to you. I was pissed off. The Courier-Journal reports Baker's family last year raised more than $21,000 for Bevan. Tonight, Democratic lawmakers are demanding answers. We owe it to the people of Kentucky to dive in and figure out what happened and determine if their trust has been betrayed. Bevin, a Trump ally who last month lost his re-election bid, tweeting late tonight, America is a nation that was established with an understanding and support for redemption and second chances. Robert said, don't believe everything you hear. All right, so remember that award-winning docu-series that shed light on sexual misconduct allegations against R. Kelly? Well, it's now getting a sequel. Lifetime announced Surviving R. Kelly Part 2. The Reckoning will air next month. It'll feature interviews with new alleged survivors and supporters. Kelly has denied any wrongdoing in all of this as he faces state and federal charges right now. The network says more than 26.8 million people watched that original documentary earlier this year. The latest installment is set to unfold over three nights starting January 2nd. The bodies of six people have been recovered days after a deadly volcanic eruption on a small island in New Zealand. And now police and military specialists have launched the risky operation to recover the remains for a lot more people this morning. NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer reports from New Zealand. This morning, a high-stakes mission to recover bodies from the island. Military teams wearing protective suits recovered six bodies about a 1,000 feet from the crater. A ground search failed to find two others, now believed to be in the water. The conditions and terrain on the island were difficult. Yet it also revealed the first look at White Island since the volcano erupted, now a moonscape of thick ash. The island is highly volatile. Even today, there was the chance it would erupt. But authorities here are feeling pressure to give families closure. Relatives of the missing boarded boats before dawn, holding a prayer service at sea. The tragedy has taken an emotional toll here, a town that thrives on tourism, and White Island has long been its main draw. Nearly all of the 47 people on the island were tourists who had come to New Zealand from other countries for vacation. Can you speak to plans that are in the works now to try to get the wounded home? I do not believe there are other plans in place yet, but till that time, they will be in the very best of care here. Recovery teams will be back out there tomorrow. Divers will search the water around the island for the two bodies they believe are still missing. Janice Mackey Prayer, NBC News, Pakatani, New Zealand. And tonight, the CDC reporting the number of flu cases continues to rise. 23 states are reporting widespread activity, and the South seems to be among one of the most active right now, with Georgia already reporting one death so far. Nationwide, 10 children have already died this flu season. The doctors are reminding folks to, you know, it's not too late for you to get your flu shot if you're able to. All right, 19 years ago, a little boy here in Atlanta received the gift of life from a newborn baby in Texas. And nearly two decades later, the mother of that baby wants to reconnect with the little boy who is now a man and has a piece of her daughter's heart. Tiffany Liu from our sister station in Dallas has this mother's story. That was the day after she was born when we were leaving the hospital. Most people never met Crystal Hogan's daughter. This is um, her memory book that the funeral home gave to me. Emma was a day away from being three months old. I just remember them telling me as I watched from behind the glass that her heartbeat just was not strong. It was SIDS. And she wasn't gonna make it. They asked me if I wanted to hold her. Sudden infant death syndrome. Um, while she passed away, and I did. Almost two decades passed. But Crystal doesn't have closure, knowing a part of her daughter is still out there. I remember a gentleman coming in a few minutes after that and telling me that there was a little boy that could really use Emma's heart valves and that it would save his life and if I would consider donating them. Crystal has no idea who he is, but knows he was only a week old. He received 
um, her heart valves on August 7th, 2000 in Atlanta, Georgia. Emma's death gave him life. I wonder about like his prom and his graduation. I wonder like, is he going off to college right now? She wants to hear his heart beat with the help of Emma's valves. Yeah. Crystal hopes he hears this message and reaches out. He's loved by people that he doesn't even know. And I hope that he has had an incredible life and has got to experience many, many things. And I hope more than anything that he hugs his mama. That's what Emma's mama wants him to know. All right, sports is next after the break. We'll be right back. Well, tomorrow marks seven years since the horrific shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut. And tonight there is new hope as a group founded by Newtown Parent there has opened the first crisis center of its kind to prevent other school tragedies. Kate Snow has the first look. No, nobody gets in trouble. We're just here to help gather information, okay? 
tucked away in this Miami office. I just wanted to make sure that someone spoke to him. Every beep is another tip coming in. There's an immense power here because they're saving lives and intervening right now as we stand here. Nicole Hockley is a co-founder of Sandy Hook Promise, and this is the first national crisis center focused on school safety. School districts in 21 states are training students to use the program Say Something. They can submit a tip anonymously, online, by phone, or most popular, through a mobile app. It's about preventing a disaster in school instead of reacting to one. This is about how you change a culture to really look out for each other and giving the kids the control over their environment and what they do versus saying that this is an unsafe environment and you need to practice running and hiding. This is a tip you got last month? Yes. About a potential school shooting? Yes. Saying that they're extremely afraid to come to school because of this threat. Jessica Neely is the crisis center manager. Since opening in September, her counselors have handled more than 5,000 tips, responding within seconds, connecting with the school and authorities as needed. The tipster says here, thank you so much for letting me talk to you. If I find anything else out, I will let you know. That shows that they trust the system. Yes. You're doing a really good job right now. Do you know One of the most common sort of tips, like students worried a friend might hurt themselves. Them. Where's the razor right now? Hockley believes the Sandy Hook shooting, where she lost her six-year-old Dylan, might have been prevented if someone had spoken up. I made a promise to him seven years ago um, that I would do everything I could to honor his legacy and to prevent school shootings going forward. And this is part of honoring that promise, saving others' lives in his name. No, this saving lives by teaching students to say something. The cold weather didn't stop uh, the lines forming earlier today at the new gas station in Suwannee this morning. That's because customers were able to take advantage of gas for 76 cents a gallon. Hundreds of people lined Petrie Industrial Boulevard in hopes of getting that cheap gas, and it was all part of the station's grand opening. Deal seekers sold 11 alive. Despite the long lines and the rain this morning, the hour-long wait was well worth it. Awesome, awesome, it makes me feel awesome. You know, to save that amount of money, it's awesome. I am number 63. Um, okay. I'm here because I'm on a budget right now, and when gas is less than half the cost of it is everywhere else, it's worth it to come. Amazing, that's definitely a huge blessing to have, to just pump for 76 cents versus the two and three dollars that's been going around now. So not everybody was able to get that 76 cent gas, but the station can also give away prizes to customers who missed out on that deal. For more on this story, make sure you visit mylawrencevillenews.com. We still have this good area of rain over us right now with these uh, moderate showers, even some pockets of heavy rain. So a couple things I want you to watch here. The individual cells are moving up from the southwest to the north and east, but at the same time, the back edge is pushing in from the west and moving this over to the east. So we're already see the, seeing the rain ending in much of northwest Georgia and parts of west Georgia out I-20 and parts of Carroll County that's moving out, Harrelson County, uh, Polk County, it's beginning to move out too. Let me bring you in closer to Atlanta though. We still have that good moderate rain over us. It reaches down to the south side. It moves up toward the north and east and it's over to the east of us as well. In Newton County, we've got some heavier showers. I want to take you down to the south. We've been watching this area of rain near Macon that has been producing some lightning that's moving up closer to Baldwin County near Milledgeville may impact part of uh, the Putnam County area. Jasper County had some in the south side a little bit earlier south of Monticello. So on the south side, if you've been hearing some thunder or maybe seeing some flashes of lightning from a distance, that's where it's coming from. And that's weakening as it moves on over to the east. Now I'm going to put this into motion. Let's widen out just a little bit so y'all can see here the individual cells moving north and east out of the south and west. And there you see, watch some of that lightning here with these storms down to the south. So you folks down around Lake Oconee, Lake Sinclair, you might be hearing some of that light, hearing that thunder. So you can see the back edge though. This is the part I want you to see how that is moving toward the east. So this is the signal of our improving weather that we're going to have during the overnight hours. We're going to see this last batch of more organized rain move out and then will finally begin to dry out somewhat. So let me show you what else we're watching out there with the bigger picture. And you can see here as we zoom in, I want to show you some of these rainfall totals. Now some areas have picked up some good rain. Notice that those totals are lower to the north and west. Not as much rain there. In Atlanta, many areas have picked up between one and two inches. I just checked the official readings at Hartsfield Jackson. As of right now, we're at 1.8 inches of rain there. We have some areas over on the uh, east side near Conyers over an inch. Look down to the south near 
of Coweta County near Peachtree City. Almost three inches of rain has fallen there. Other areas of two plus inches down to the south and the east of us. And you can see mainly south and east. That's where those higher rainfall amounts are. There's all the thunder and lightning well down to the south. That's going to stay to the south. So for tonight, that rain's going to push out. There's that back edge moving through. Now in the morning, we're going to start off with some clouds around and maybe a lingering light shower or two and some mist and drizzle. But for the most part, that rain is going to be pushing out. The clouds will then decrease during the day on Saturday. We'll actually have some sunshine coming through in the uh, afternoon hours and temperatures move up to 55. Then a little warmer on Sunday up to 61 with partly cloudy skies. We're going to watch really closely the next system coming in late Monday and Tuesday to the west of us on Monday in Mississippi and Alabama. Those could be strong storms. All indications are that that's going to weaken as it moves into our area late Monday into Tuesday. It dries out and then gets cold Wednesday and Thursday. All right, so good news, bad news. The good news, we have the biggest game of the night, and the bad news is it's the final Team 1-1 Friday night game. Day one of the state championships going on at Georgia State Stadium, and it's their first year at the new stadium after leaving Mercedes-Benz Stadium because of the cost there. It was cold, it was rainy, but there was fantastic action. So let's take a look here. Let's start with 4A. Buford taking on Warner Robins, tied at 7. Warner Robins, Jalen Adden, or Addy rather, runs into the end zone. Warner Robins has a 14-7 lead. It was almost enough, but with less than 30 seconds left of that game. Take a look here. Demarius Isaac makes an incredible catch, ties that game. So we go on to overtime. Warner Robins with the ball first. The throw to the end zone intercepted. High school rules don't allow you to run it back. So Buford's Hayden Olsen would end up kicking the field goal for that win. Buford wins 17-14 in overtime. The game, the team's quarterback after the game talked about, you know, the game and the pressure he felt towards the end of that game. And he was pretty humble. Take a listen. Not that much, I know. I was going to be out there, uh, go out there and do my thing, you know. I knew my players had my back, my teammates, and the whole community. Just go get it done. It's not finished. It's not over. We still got a whole other quarter to play. It's not done. And we came out here and got the job done. All right, so Elka also took on Wesleyan. The Chargers going for the fifth consecutive state title. Wesleyan controlled the first half, last chance for a touchdown before halftime. But the trick play doesn't work, though. Second half, it was all Elka. Kayton Mitchell breaks free for a huge run. 75-yard touchdown to put Elka in front. Fourth quarter, he wasn't done. Watch him run, run, run over everyone there. He gets a touchdown. The Chargers get another ring, a 33-13 win. After that game, the coach talked about how they made the run in the second half. Everybody talks about halftime adjustments. The adjustment was, hey, guys, you got to play defense. Quit giving up on third and long, and you got to block. That was the adjustment. You made history five state championships in a row. What do you think about that? To me, what I think is it's a great feeling. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right, so let's go to 2A. Wouldn't be the championships without some controversy, right? Dublin fumbles. Brooks County's Tyreek Thomas scoops and scores. But take a good look here. You know, it looks like he's down. There's no replay review in Georgia, so play on, right? Fortunately, though, wouldn't change the results. Markel Mitchell with a big run to the end zone to put the Irish out front. Then Zion Kemp with the exclamation point. Another touchdown for Dublin. Dublin wins 42-32. First title since 2006 when they tied for the title. But this one, all theirs. It belongs to the kids and those people in those stands. They supported us like nobody else ever has. I'm so proud to have the opportunity to come back. And uh, this one didn't end in a tie. <laughs> you can tell there was a lot of screaming in that game, right? All right, we'll have more from the state championships tomorrow. So stick with 11 Alive all weekend long and we'll bring all the action to you. We'll be right back.
Well, here's a look at radar. I noticed a couple of things. We still have the yellows and oranges from Atlanta over to the east, pretty much along the I-85 corridor and to the east. That is where we have the more moderate to heavy rain. But look at the back edge that's coming in from the west where it's starting to dry out. That's going to keep moving over to the east. So in just a little bit, we're going to see this rain ending in Atlanta or tapering off. Early in the morning, still a lingering shower possible, and then we're clearing out for the rest of the weekend before the next round of rain comes in Monday and Tuesday. Well, here's to sunshine this weekend. Yes. <laughs> All right, have a great weekend.